I look like the kind of person who builds Lego sets in his spare time? Probably not. But on my 13th birthday, my friend Lily came over. And with her, she brought this big cardboard box and this big fat binder, as thick as a textbook. And in this big cardboard box was an 843-piece Middle Eastern Lego castle. And in this big fat binder were instructions that Lila hand wrote on a Perkins Brailler by hand, letting me know what kind of pieces I needed, where they should be placed, and what everything would look like when all was set and done. Here's how it worked. Okay, so if we take something like the Hogwarts Castle, the instructions for this step are put a flat 3 by one horizontally in the middle of the front side on the 16 by 2 piece on the first row. Put a one by one with the clasp to the right of it, clasp to the front and overhanging. Put one three button corner piece at the left back corner in the shape of the letter F and the other one symmetrically the right one in the shape of the letter D. Put one one by one piece on the back wall, skipping one button to the left from the right corner piece and the other symmetrically on the right. And that describes this picture where you have these six pieces and you put them here and here and here. That sounds like a really relaxing way to spend your afternoon, doesn't it? <laughs> So when we made these text-based instructions, Lina made them because she wanted me to have the experience of building a set from start to finish on my own. And when I had this experience, I realized that I couldn't keep it to myself. I had to give it to others. You see, blind people learn by touching things. So if, for example, I wanted to figure out what the Statue of Liberty felt like, I would try and climb it. Trouble is, <laughs> that would get me arrested. So. If I build that same Statue of Liberty out of Lego, then I am able to become intimately familiar with why it's shaped the way it is, and thus learn more about the parts of the world that are untouchable to blind people. I realized that I had to give this to other blind kids. They deserve this. So Lena and I started a website called Lego for the Blind. And onto this website, we put text-based instructions for every single Lego set that we could get our hands on. And as soon as the site went up, we got emails from hundreds of parents of blind children and blind kids themselves saying, hey, this is so cool. Could you make this set accessible and that set accessible? And what about this other set? Can you make that one accessible? And we had to turn them down. You see, this is just a two-person operation. Lila would write the text-based instructions, and I would build the actual set to make sure that the instructions were correct. So that's when I realized that we had to take this project up a notch. So. I got in touch with Lego and asked them whether they'd be interested in making their own text-based instructions so that blind kids could build their sets like sighted kids do. Lila died two years ago. And I promised myself that I would not let this project rest until Lego themselves took action. And now they have. This fall, Lego will be incorporating text-based instructions into the new sets that they're releasing so that blind kids can build them on their own, just like sighted kids. As a child, my parents and I used to travel during school vacations, and we'd rappel down waterfalls and swim with dolphins and zip line through the rainforest. And it was thrilling. And as I grew older, I wondered what else was out there and what my experience of it would be like as a blind traveler. Is it really that different from what sighted people experience? So I started traveling alone. Traveling as a blind person alone is really, really stressful. I always say short prayer when I'm sprinting full speed across the street because I never know when the light will turn red. That's a fun time, I guarantee you. <laughs> Airports are even worse. Getting to the gate isn't the hard part. Airport assistants can easily get you there. The trouble is when you're already at the gate. Sighted people, they can look at their phones or overhead screens to figure out when their flight is leaving and whether they're at the right gate. Blind people can't. So you have to listen to every single conversation. OK, let's see. To my left, there is a couple. And they found out that Puddles the cat has been locked out of the apartment. They're calling their daughter, and they're yelling, get Puddles in here. He needs to be fed. What do you think? Why do you think we left? You need to take care of him. OK, that's not going to help me. OK, let's see. To my right. A uh, mother and daughter are talking. 
Uh, turns out that daughter hasn't been doing her homework for the last week because she says, oh, vacation, I don't have to do anything. Mother disagrees and is threatening to take away daughter's smartphone. Daughter's about to have a meltdown also. Not going to help me. Okay, let's see. Behind me, they're speaking Mandarin Chinese. So that's definitely not going to help me. Because of all this stress, a lot of blind people, they just stay home because it's easy. Nothing's going to happen to you. There's no danger if you stay home. So... Recently, I started a podcast called Blind Guide Travels to document my experiences. From narrow urban tunnels to art museums to exploring the accordion capital of the world, a small Italian town, Blind Guide Travels aims to level the playing field between blind and sighted travelers using 3D sound, so the sound's all around your head, and you really feel like you're there, you're with me. And it does so to encourage blind people to get out there and travel. As a blind person, going to the movies is really underwhelming. <laughs> Here's what it's like when I go to the movies without an eloquent friend describing what's happening. The following is a scene from X-Men Apocalypse. Congratulations, you are now as thoroughly confused as I am. <laughs> now, here's that same scene, but with an eloquent friend describing exactly what's going on and why. Car speeds by, but time slows down. Bumblebees, their wings moving very slowly as they drown out the flowers. Quicksilver has arrived. Standing on the highway, looking around, taking the scene. Eating a Twinkie, he sees the X-Men mansion, he sees a couple of X-Men in their car, speeding past, frozen, releases Twinkie, picks the chart, and goes racing into the Xavier mansion. Through the halls, through the whole thing, down to the basement where the fireball is going to expand. He sees the fireball, he sees some people sitting down, he nudges a few pieces of debris out of the way, cracks his knuckles, and gets to work. Grabs Hank, speeds him out. Whoa, that makes so much more sense now. <laughs> I get it, I get it. But even with this eloquent friend describing exactly what was happening and how it was happening, I still felt like I wasn't completely on board. I was still missing things. I recently went to the Sundance Film Festival, and there were some virtual reality exhibits on display. So I thought, oh, well, this, this will be cool. Virtual reality, next big thing. Let's put on these bulky goggles and see what happens. So I strapped them on and was thoroughly disappointed. <laughs> you see... All this virtual reality stuff, it's intended for sighted people. And it uses these fancy graphics and eye candy and 3D modeling to make sure that sighted people stay engaged. That doesn't really work for blind people. So I wondered, what if you made this motion simulating helmet that affects the vestibular system, it has these wheels and they spin and they affect your sense of balance. So when you wear this, you feel like you're part of this experience, like you're the main character. Like you're falling, you're flipping, you're flying through the air. And so, I was thinking about this, and I've been a comic book fan since I was a child. My dad used to read me Daredevil comics as a kid. And I found it pretty ironic that the only blind superhero is in a medium that's completely inaccessible to blind people. But when dad read me these comics, what fascinated me most was the amount of detail. There was so much detail crammed into a box the size of a postage stamp. And as I grew older, I wondered, well, how can blind people read these comic books on their own? I realized that the only way they could do this was through novelizations, which is fine, but the trouble is, these novelizations have pages and pages of lead-up before someone actually gets punched in the face. <laughs> as opposed to real comics, where it's like panel seven. Captain America smacks Baron Zemo in the face with his shield. Baron Zemo's head snaps back. Done. There it is. It happened. That immediacy of action was something that I was really missing from the books that I was reading at the time. So I wondered, what if you make a 3D sound radio drama of this comic book, you adapt it, and then you connect it with this motion simulating helmet so that you feel like you're Daredevil, jumping from rooftop to rooftop? 
then that would be a virtual reality experience for blind people. On my 13th birthday, when Lila gave me that Lego set, there was no blueprint on how to make text-based instructions. She made them on her own, and she had to be creative. There's no podcast about blind travelers or comics for blind people. I make them because I want people to have access to them. If there's something that you're passionate about and you want to spread that passion, then give it to those who would otherwise be unable to access it. Those people will thank you, and you'll have to be the most creative you've ever been because you'll have no choice. The creativity that I use every day to help these people do what they never thought they'd be able to do and the joy that it brings these people is what drives me and what will drive you to make the most impact. Thank you.